U.S. air power is a force that's been unrivaled since the end of the Cold War. It might be tempting to think that it's because of technological superiority. But it's not stealth or precision weapons that's the real foundation of American air power, though they do certainly help. After all, we saw that in 1999, a 1960s era surface-to-air missile was able to bring down a stealth fighter over Serbia. So what is the secret behind U.S. air supremacy? That's what we're going to find out in this video. The short answer is that it's all about teamwork. But I know that's vague and doesn't really answer the question. So let's take a look at how the U.S. military is organized to see how our air power team is put together. And we'll start that deep dive with the question. Can the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who is the highest ranking officer of the service, order an airstrike on an overseas target? Believe it or not, the answer is no. That authority does not rest in the Pentagon. In fact, every time there is an airstrike, the order comes down from someone outside the Pentagon. So let's go over why that is. Like with a lot of lessons in warfare, the decision to organize things this way came from decades of mistakes. In the early 80s, after the disastrous failure of Operation Eagle Claw to rescue American hostages from the besieged embassy in Iran, a study was made to address the shortcomings that led to that catastrophe. A lot of problems were uncovered that were all a symptom of inner service rivalry. The services acted on their own, which often resulted in a division of effort. A good example of this is how in the Vietnam War the country was divided into several areas of air operations called route packages. The Air Force and Navy each took a portion of them, and very rarely would they operate in the other's areas. There was very little cooperation between the services, and it contributed to the eventual defeat of U.S. forces. To address this, Congress passed the Goldwater-Nichols Act in 1986. It's named after the two lawmakers that sponsored the bill, and what it did was reorganize the military. Combat units would now fall under a unified chain of command, which was separate from the part of the military that maintained the forces. The end result was the creation of combatant commanders for different regions of the world. Any U.S. combat forces in one of those regions would report directly to that combatant commander instead of to their service chief. So you might be asking, what do the service chiefs do? Their job is explained in the act too. Simply put, the services are now responsible to organize, train, and equip their forces. Then they loan these forces out to the combatant commanders for use in operations. So when you hear about someone in the military deploying overseas, this is what's happening. They're just being temporarily loaned out to a combatant commander. Operationally, they fall under the control of the combatant commander. This is known as OPCON, which is short for operational control. Administratively, they still belong to their home unit, which is called ADCON. When that service member is at home, their unit has both OPCON and ADCON over the member. Combatant commanders are organized into geographical regions like this. Any combat operations in one of these areas will fall under the command of one person, regardless of service. You'll often hear these areas referred to as AORs, which stands for Area of Responsibility. Over on the left, we see a few that are labeled Functional Combatant Commands. These are commands that aren't limited to a geographic region, but a function of the military. They can operate anywhere. Cyber operations are global, and the same goes for transport and special operations. Strategic Command is responsible for nuclear weapons. There's one overall commander for each of these areas, too. Now let's take a closer look at one of these commands. U.S. Central Command, or CENTCOM for short, is responsible for this area centered on the Persian Gulf. And in 1991, it was the centerpiece for one of this new system's earliest operations, Operation Desert Storm. At the time, the CENTCOM commander was Norman Schwarzkopf. Within the theater, he would be called the Joint Forces Commander, or JFC for short. Coordinating a wide variety of combat forces isn't easy, so the JFC will have a staff that will help spread out the workload. For the air component, there will be a Joint Forces Air Component Commander, or JFAC. The JFAC will have counterparts for the land and maritime components as well. Each of these component commanders will be in charge of their respective force. But it's not as simple as it sounds, because there's some overlap. So what happens to forces like Army Aviation or a Carrier's Air Wing that don't neatly fit into one of the three categories? This is up to the JFC's discretion, so it can vary from one combatant command to the next. 
but typically you'll see Army rotary wing given to the land component and Navy fixed wing aircraft split between the JFAC and the Maritime Commander. So you might see a situation where 36 of a carrier's 72 fighters are under the command of the JFAC. The other half are kept by the Maritime Commander in a purely fleet defense role. They cannot be used to go on strike missions because then it would violate the centralized command structure that this is all based on. So before any orders are even given, the forces will be handed out to the component commanders. Then they all act under the centralized vision of the JFC. That unified vision needs to be broken down into smaller bits before pilots can start flying missions for it. So let's take a look at how that process works. During the build-up to Desert Storm, Norman Schwarzkopf was handed the task of removing Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait and neutralizing his ability to coordinate a counterattack. These kind of vague directives are what is expected from national level leaders, and it's the job of the military's chain of command to turn them into something more actionable. That all starts with creating a list of targets that need to be attacked. This list is vetted and validated to ensure that those targets are current and necessary. It's then prioritized to put the targets with the most immediate effects at the top. So for example, in Desert Storm, the occupying ground forces in Kuwait were actually at the bottom of the list. While they were the main goal, there were objectives that needed to be achieved before they could be directly engaged. For example, air defense is protecting those ground forces and the supply lines feeding them fuel and ammunition. Communications and power were also prioritized since removing those would paralyze the Iraqi chain of command. Another important step in the process is to minimize the risk for civilian casualties and the choice of targets. The JFC will often set aside criteria to help with this decision. For example, a maximum population density will be set. So if there are too many people per square mile around a potential target, then that target won't make it onto the list. The final list of targets is sent to the JFC for approval, and once completed, it's called the Joint Integrated Prioritized Target List, or JPITL for short. This final list is what everyone, regardless of component, will be working on throughout the campaign. When every target on the list has been serviced, the JFC's goals should be accomplished. Now a list of targets is useful, but it's still not enough to send out your pilots on missions. Those targets need to be matched up with aircraft and air crews, and that's done by the JFAC. The JFAC will take a part of the target list that won't be serviced by the other components. These targets are then matched with available air assets. The final list of targets matched up with aircraft sorties is called the Air Tasking Order, or ATO. The ATO is then handed off to the wings deployed in theater for execution. It contains mission orders for the next 24 hours of operations, so one of these is sent out every day by the JFAC. But not every detail of each mission will be filled in. This isn't an oversight, it's intentional. Part of it will be left to the discretion of the wings. One of the lessons learned from decades of past mistakes was that micromanaging forces from a headquarters far removed from the battlefield is a bad idea. Highly specific details are best handled by the people closest to the front. This is their business, and they'll have better intel in the current situation around them. On the flip side of that coin, leaving all the details in the hands of the lowest level units also causes problems. An Air Force works best when it can bring large amounts of firepower to bear where it's needed. You need a centralized command to do that. So the Air Force came up with an approach that leverages the best from both ends of that spectrum. Officially, it's called Centralized Command, Decentralized Execution and it works just like we've discussed. The centralized command, in this case the JFAC, sends out the bare minimum of instructions to get everyone working towards a common goal. The decentralized execution part is the process of the wings filling in the blanks. This is where the planners come up with the flight plans to get the air crews to the targets on time. They'll use the most up-to-date intel they have available to make sure those routes are safe, and they'll add in several contingencies for emergencies. So the entire process isn't all done by the JFAC, or the JFC, or the wings. It's split up across the entire chain. This way, the air crews that finally fly the mission can make the most of their time in the air. In the future, the U.S. Air Force expects adversaries to try and disrupt this process by using new technologies, like advanced jamming or long-range hypersonic weapons. So the approach is being changed up. CCDE is getting another step added in the middle called Distributed Control. 
Simply put, it means the JFAC will give the wings enough information and the authority to continue an organized fight in the event that the communications line is cut. This system has worked out exceptionally well since it was implemented in the late 1980s. The first time it was used in combat was the 1989 invasion of Panama known as Operation Just Cause. That was soon followed by the 1991 liberation of Kuwait, better known as Operation Desert Storm. Both of these operations were resounding successes and proved that this concept of joint operations worked. And ever since then, this is how the US has been fighting all its wars. Now I want to go into more detail about the air tasking order, so I'm going to devote the entire next episode of this series to exploring all those details, and I hope you'll come back to see that one.